Okay, today we're kind of doing a, a, a series, if you will, a, kind of an Advent series, and uh, it's sort of like we're, we're taking a journey. And uh, so today the theme is going to be a little different than what the candle theme is. Today, as far as our service and our uh, sermon is concerned, the theme is hope. And we, we want to talk about finding hope in the desert. So for the next two or three weeks, we'll have a different theme for the sermon. And uh, it's going to be based on hope. So today, finding hope in the desert. Next week, the theme will be finding hope in disillusionment. Thinking about John the Baptist. And then on Blue Christmas, uh, we're going to talk about finding hope in the darkness. And so I just want to say today uh, that our Blue Christmas service is not designed to make you more blue. Uh, it's designed for us to find that hope in dark times because uh, we all recognize that there is. And we want to acknowledge that. We don't want to ignore it. But we don't want to focus on it either because, you know, if you get in the pits and you just focus on the, the darkness, then you'll be more darker. You'll be more blue. But if you can look for the, the ray of hope, in that darkness. If you can find hope in the darkness, then you're more likely to come out of that darkness. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. So we're kind of taking a journey. If you think about it, uh, any journey when you start out, there's always some questions in our mind. And one of the questions that children will often ask if we go on a trip is, are we there yet? You know? And uh, sometimes we're all excited about where we're going. And sometimes we get drugged along to places we don't want to go. We're kind of sitting in the back seat with our arms crossed and we're not happy about it. We just kind of go along. So it's really our, our attitude. It's the same way in the church. As the church moves forward, sometimes people are excited about what's happening and others sit with their arms folded, upset because of the changes or because of what's going on. They're not really happy about it. And so they make the journey much more unpleasant. It is always much more fun if you get involved in the journey and you enjoy the journey as you go. This uh, summer, we had the wonderful privilege uh, of going out west for the first time that I was able to go to Yellowstone. And it was just an exciting time. And we drove the entire almost 2,000 miles uh, to, to, the, to get there in the vehicle. Now, if you drive 2,000 miles, you want to make sure that it's people you enjoy their company with, you know, because it could be a long, long, long drive if you do not. And uh, I, you know, Bruce is uh, 14 now, and I'll be 15 on the 30th, and uh, it was a pleasant drive. We, we listened to podcasts, and we listened to, we, we all got to use Spotify to, to have our favorite songs and different things. We just enjoyed the drive, and we were anticipating the journey and, and the destination and the beautiful sights among uh, just everywhere you look. It was breathtaking. Different different kinds of sights. You know, it wasn't all the same. You know, was, there were deserts, there was mountains, there was beautiful snow peak mountains. And it was just an awesome, awesome thing. And uh, we just enjoyed each other's company. Of course, it took us a little long to get there because Sandy wanted to stop at every site and take a picture. Uh, but I like if we don't, if we ain't take a picture at every place we see, we're never going to make it. Uh, but just like any journey, it's an exciting and adventurous time to know that you're going someplace, There's some place you want to go, some place you've never been before. And as Christians, we're on a journey. But on the way to that destination, there are dangers. There are places of, uh, that are challenging. And sometimes we find our place, our, ourselves in a barren desert, a wasteland, a wilderness, if you will, not unlike those in the Bible. And so today we come to this passage where uh, John the Baptist is, and I'm going to turn there, Matthew chapter 3, this passage here. Where John the Baptist is find, found himself as well, and we've kind of uh, we talked about some of this uh, in in the uh, coming days ahead. So as I said today, we're kind of focusing on the desert, and in Matthew three verses one through two, if you want to turn there, feel free to, to join us. The passage is 
pretty familiar to, to most of us. And he says in, uh, in verse 1, In those days John came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let me stop there and say to you that uh, John the Baptist's message was similar to Jesus' message. And it was simply this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, repent is not something that we want to hear today. It's not a popular word, but it's still a necessary um, ingredient in order to find joy on the journey. And so, uh, John the Baptist was basically preaching, and I think that he was preaching the almost the immediate uh, kingdom coming, that, that if they, uh, that when he saw Jesus, he they were looking for a king to set up a kingdom, as you know, on this earth. And when Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist thought, this is it. He's going to set up his kingdom. Finally, the long-awaited king has come, and we're going to rule, and we're going to reign. It's a wonderful time. So John the Baptist, with all the fervor that you can imagine, preaching in the desert, repent for the kingdom of heaven. And so the message is not, hey, you're just going to be able to go on into the kingdom. The message is something they didn't expect. The unexpected aspect of the kingdom was repentance. You see, they didn't get that because they thought because of their pedigrees, because they were Jews, because they were children of Abraham, and they were considered people who were righteous, that they could automatically just get into the kingdom of God, like a lot of people today. You know, you can't get, as the old preacher said, you can't get into heaven on the shirt tails of mom and dad. There's only one way. You must go through the door. And that door is Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist, so all of a sudden he begins to proclaim the kingdom of heaven was, was near. And so they were excited. And they, they came to be baptized. And the, the baptism that they came for was just simply an identification. They wanted to join with John and be a part of this messianic kingdom. It wasn't about, with them, about salvation. It wasn't about anything about repentance. It was about simply joining up. Kind of like, sign my name to the dotted line. Put me down. I'm, I'm ready for this. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. But then John said something they didn't quite understand. There's a repentance necessary. And he said, before I'm going to baptize you, I want you to bring forth fruit that shows me that you are truly a person whose heart has been changed. Boy, he was a tough one. Wasn't he? he was a tough person. But here they are. And their message has gone out. Now, had they accepted Jesus, he could have ushered in the kingdom. But we know that's not what happened. And because of that, then it would only be at the second coming that he would set up, set up his kingdom. And so, in a sense, the kingdom was, was delayed because of the people's unbelief. And so, John the Baptist preaches this message, and he comes out of the wilderness in uh, camel's hair and eating uh, locusts and honey, and, and then the, which was acceptable under the law. Can you imagine that? But yet, they, I think what the problem was, which is a lot of problem with people today, it was they were so full of pride they weren't willing to admit they were wrong. And because of that, it was a stumbling block for many of the Jews. And then the other reading for today is in Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, that's mentioned in your, I think it's in the bulletin. <clears throat> in chapter 10, Isaiah 1, uh, excuse me, 11, 1 through 10. And he said, there shall come out, come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. For those of you that spend any time in the forest and in the woods, you've probably seen those, those times when trees have been, uh, because of nature or whatever, have sort of been destroyed or uh, have died, decayed, and yet sometimes you'll see, maybe even from a forest fire, from one of the seeds of the tree, or an 
acorn or whatever, just a stem beginning to come up. Just from that tree, a seed has made it into the earth and has taken root and has begun to grow. And that's what has happened. That even though uh, Satan tried to defeat Jesus, there was still a seed. And out of that rod is the stem of Jesse. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. <coughs> and it says in verse 3, And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and she, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But he says, um, in verse 4, but with righteousness shall be judged the poor. He doesn't judge the way we judge, by appearance and by popularity, but with righteousness. And he reproved with e equity for the meat of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, faithfulness the girdle of his reign. And so this rod, this uh, stem or branch would grow up from the stump, which is the family of David. Jesse was David's father. And uh, he would, in, it would culminate in the birth of the Messiah. And it would be characterized by faithfulness of the Holy Spirit and integrity. And then verse 6 through 9 begins to talk about the future, the second coming. And it begins to talk about the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And in verse 8, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the ass, the snake, and the winged child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in Ezekiel 34, I'm going to turn over there to verse 25. Ezekiel 34, verse 25 says, I will praise, I will make with them a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land. And they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And so you have the idea here of the kingdom of being a place of peace. Are we there yet? No. We aren't there yet. But we look forward in this wilderness, in this barren land that we find ourselves in, in this time of wondering and waiting and anticipation, wondering, is it ever going to happen? We see that God is saying there is a future yet out there for the people of God. A place. And we want to know that. We want to hear that, that in this time, in this place, we want to hear about Wolves lying with the lambs and children being able to lead those dangerous animals and lie down together in safety and peace. That's the kind of world that we long for. It's not the kind of world we live in, but it's the kind of world we long for. Peace. Imagine being able to just live your lives in the kingdom and not have to worry about violence. I just finished reading a book that I got for my birthday called Wild, uh, Wild Awakening. And in this book, true story, a fellow goes, his brother, into the remote parts of Alaska. It's a great book. And finds himself either looking or hunting, uh, mostly moose. But in this situation, he comes upon this huge grizzly bear who had his cubs. And grizzly bears are a little different than black bears. Uh, a lot of times around here, the black bears will run away from you, but grizzly bears don't always do that. But anyway, uh, the, 
bear charging. And he shoots, he has a shotgun, and he shoots the bear and, and does make <clears throat> to the jaw of the bear. But it doesn't seem to even stop him in the face. And the bear attacks him. And in the middle of this barrage, this attack, he begins to lose consciousness and blood and mingle and all this broken flesh and bones and just ripping him apart. There comes a point when he almost gives up. And he wants to just give in and die. And in the midst of this, he hears the voice of the Lord speak to him and say, keep fighting. And then he sees a vision of his, his children and his wife at home saying, Dad, Dad, keep fighting. And that is all he needed to give him the hope to keep on fighting. And I don't know what it's going to take when you're in your valley, when you're in your desert, when you're in your wilderness, to find that hope to go on. But I want you to know that Jesus today has given you the hope, and he gives you the strength, and he wants you to keep fighting. There will be those that say to you, just quit. Just give up. Why try to even fight? But God says, no. I've got a hope for you. I've got a future, a plan to prosper you. I've got a plan out there. Don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Sometimes it looks like there's just no hope. We just want to throw in our hand, throw in the towel and quit. Not long ago, I, uh, you know, I, I went camping. And, you know, I find, I always seem to get in these situations sometimes and get myself uh, in, in, uh, in situations. But I went, uh, went on Pine Mountain, uh, I was telling Mark about this one day, and drove my truck as far as back in the mountains as I could go, and then actually it's, it wasn't even a road where I was. It was, a, it was a part of a trail that led to a backpack shoulder that I camped out. And so my dog and I got out of the truck, and <clears throat> then I realized that I had locked both sets of keys in the truck and my cell phone. So now I couldn't even call anybody for help. And I'm in back miles on top of White Bird Mountain, back, and I would have to walk miles out to get out. And I look inside the truck and there's no crack in the window, no way I'm getting those windows down. I see my cell phone, I see the keys, and everything was in reach. But I could not get to it. And I want to say at that moment I just felt overwhelmed. I felt hopeless, but I did pray. And I said, I'm not going to panic. This will work out. You know, I may have to walk for miles to find if somebody has a phone, but whatever, it will work out. I had no tools. Of course, if I had, they were in the truck. Nothing to get it open with. So I looked around, <clears throat> and there was a sign with a metal rod, the flamingo shelter. So there was a flamingo, a metal uh, rod, and I found a tent pole. And I was able to get the door open just enough to be able to hold it with the rod, get the tent pole inside enough to get the truck unlocked. And I sent the text to Sandy, it said, danger of her. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, what could have been a very, very long day turned out okay. But sometimes, you know, we get in those situations sometimes, we, we, we panic, we think there's no hope. Then we realize that we don't panic. We just take a breath and just put our trust in God. God's going to get us through. He's going to take us through. He's going to help us. We are going to make it to the end. You know, sometimes it's kind of like in this life we, we, uh, we look for the silver lining. Y'all know that uh, this past week there was a lot of, a lot of publicity Johnson Central, which is where I graduated from, uh, along with Pikeville and the other schools went from the mountains, went to the state, and yesterday they got their victory. But uh, we heard about the, uh, what I was told, the principal of the high school uh, making fun of people from Eastern Kentucky and saying they couldn't even count to 100. And, uh, and so it was a, a very exciting time as we got to go there and watch uh, the team. And, and we were there mainly because Bruce was was in the band and we dropped, took him and, 
and we got to see uh, them win against this team. You know, the truth is, as a Christian, it may not seem like it now. It may look like we're behind. It may look like we're losing the game. But if you read the rest of the book, guess what? We're on the winning team. We have hope today. We have no reason to bow our heads and to give up today and to stick our head in the sand because I promise you that upon the authority of God's word and, and the name of Jesus Christ that the church will be victorious. That we <coughs> will rise from the ashes. And we will stand on the other side of the kingdom. And we will say, worthy is the Lamb. Thou art victorious. Are we there yet? No. But man, we're going someplace. But here's the thing. If we know what the kingdom is going to be like, it should cause us all to start living more peaceful lives and more like what the kingdom characteristics are all about. I want to invite you to do that today as the musicians come. I want to invite you today as we sing. That is the Lord lays it on your heart today. If you've got something on your heart that you need to do, that you need to give to God. Maybe you need to get saved. Maybe you need to get right. Or maybe it's you just, there's just something that you need to give to God. It might be a worry. It might be a struggle. It might be something that's holding you back from the kingdom, from moving to that destination and keeping on, keeping on. Whatever that is, give it to God today as we say.